Greetings, salam, shalom, namaste, and peace be upon you all joining us from all over the world. My name is Mehmet Kılıç. I am the president of the Journalists and Writers Foundation, and I welcome you all to our program today. This event is co-organized by the Journalists and Writers Foundation and Peace Islands Institute, both based in the United States. As we celebrate the World Interfaith Harmony Week, our goal is to come together, work together, and promote solidarity and cooperation by addressing common challenges, and at the same time, joining our efforts in peace building and reconciliation through interfaith and intercultural dialogue. Today's program will focus on the skills and knowledge we need in creating a safe space for interfaith dialogue. We also wanted to give a voice to the youth with our Global Voices digital story campaign, where young people have shared their interfaith and intercultural stories, experiences, and reflections through one to two minute videos. And we have amazing, amazing videos to share with you later on in the program. Now it's my pleasure and honor to introduce our wonderful hosts today. Nancy Falcon, is an interface dialogue expert from Argentina who is currently living in Italy. She has more than 10 years of experience in creating and monitoring intercultural and interfaith projects for leaders and actors in Argentina and abroad. She is also interested in other related fields such as gender, peace education, human rights, philosophy, and intercultural studies. She has a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you so much, Mehmet. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Our, thank you. And our second host is Dr. Rajinder Govender, who is a social cohesion advocate from South Africa. Dr. Govender is a highly motivated person in engaging people from diverse backgrounds in building peaceful and inclusive societies. He works with people in multicultural environments to promote arts and culture towards social cohesion and nation building. Dr. Govender has a PhD in social anthropology from the University of KwaZulu Natal in South Africa. Both Nancy and Dr. Govender are great friends, wonderful colleagues serving as a member of the JWF's Interfaith Committee and advisory board members. Nancy, Dr. Govender, welcome again. It's over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to say a few words about the, um, this webinar. is organized also in the framework of the World uh, Interfaith Harmony Week. So the World Interfaith Harmony Week is conceived to promote a culture of peace and non-violence was first uh, proposed by King Abdullah II of Jordan at the United Nations in 2010. This was quickly adopted by the UN General Assembly, declaring the first week of February each year as World Interfaith Harmony Week, calling on government, institution, and civil society to observe it, with several programs and initiatives that would promote the aim of World Interfaith Harmony Week. So we organize this webinar in, in this frame. And also we organize a youth campaign called for you to share their interface stories and to send, uh, uh, to send us their stories and interface experience um, through video. So I, I welcome all of you and I give the floor now to my colleague Rajender to introduce this uh, initiative. Thank you, uh, Nancy, for that very, very nice introduction. So, colleagues, my task is to give you a brief background about the second part of today's intervention, the Global Voices Program. So, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this particular session. This Global Voices Youth Interfaith Digital Story Campaign is an initiative that embodies the spirit of harmony and understanding among diverse faith communities, harnessing the power of storytelling to bridge the divides and foster mutual respect. 
The Youth Interfaith Digital Storytelling Campaign is a platform that amplifies the voices of young people from various religious backgrounds, providing them with a space to share their experiences, challenges, and aspirations through storytelling. The participants have the opportunity to showcase the richness of their traditions, promote dialogue, and inspire positive change in the communities. So that is basically the background about the second part. I will later introduce the storytellers in the form of videos. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rajendar. Uh, we have the honor of being joined by two distinguished persons, experts in inter interreligious and interfaith dialogue that are, uh, they, they are today here with us. We present the first one. Uh, she's Maria Eugenia Crespo, Maria, from United Religion Initiative. She's a friend of mine also. So um, Maria Eugenia is director, mem member support of United Religion Initiative. She's a specialist in coordinating and creating spaces for interreligious dialogue in Argentina and around the world. She has created and co-coordinated also the interfaith space for youth called Bridge Builders, which has been replicated in Spain and Brazil. So I give the floor to Rajender to introduce the, the other speaker, and then we uh, can start with discussions. Okay, the second speaker today is Cassie B. Dolan. She is the communications coordinator of the Isha Foundation in the Africa region. Now, as you all know, the Isha Foundation is led by a spiritual uh, phenomenal character by the name of Sadhguru, and he has a global presence with his spirituality and his motivational speak, uh, speaking, etc. Now, Cassie is best known in South Africa for a 20-year career in film, television, and radio as an actress and presenter. And she has developed a flair for writing both entertaining and deeply moving pieces. She was a columnist for South Africa's two big newspaper dailies, the Rand Daily Mail, as well as a, a weekend paper, the Sunday Times, which are one of the largest media group in South Africa. Cassie is a began volunteering for the Isha Foundation, an NGO founded by the Sadhguru, which focused on offering spiritual tools for the upliftment of human consciousness. In 2016, Cassie is one of millions of volunteers worldwide for the Isha Foundation, but the coordination efforts are focused in South Africa as a part of Isha Africa. She practices meditation daily, visiting the ashram in India as often as possible. The ashram is in, a, in, in South India in a place called Coimbatore. That is, Cassie will be the second speaker. Thank you. <clears throat> so, so maybe we have now an... ask Maria. Yes, we, we have an hour and a half to, the, to discuss mostly the what are the skills, what are the tools, and the knowledge that we we need to create a space of interreligious dialogue. So the floor is yours. Maybe Maria uh, can start the discussion, and we need. Maybe also... I just add one more thing. The the participants will get an opportunity to ask questions of the two speakers, and they will be because this is an interactive session. So over to Maria. Thank you. And let me start by saying that I am so honored to be among you all. Um, Nancy knows well how passionate about education I am and also um, how crucial I think it is to have young people involved in um, interfaith. Um, there is a whole generation of amazing leaders doing interfaith and um, this has engaged some members of the community, but um, including youth is assuring that this stays 
and remains in the way that we uh, work with each other. Um, and it is true, Nancy and Marisa and I were very much involved here in Argentina with a project that we called uh, Bridge Builders, um, because we really think that one very essential thing for dialogue is the image of the bridge. Um, uh, we need uh, to be grounded in our religion, either if it is a given religious practice or a choice that you do when you are grown up. But this um, impacts your identity. I feel that as an Argentine and as a Catholic, I have an identity I need to, to respect and to ground and to grow. Um, you don't think that you are religious. In my case, as a baptism, and you keep that as, yes, there's grace coming in the sacrament, but at the same time, how do you keep that going with deep uh, work, with your prayer, with your studies, with your understanding, and of course, mass and what the leaders in your religion may teach you through the years. And at the same time, um, this, for me, it has been a, an amazing experience just to have that deep growth um, and at a time discover that this identity is accompanied by so many other identities and so much um, wisdom around. There's wisdom in my own religion and wisdom around in other religions. So it was a, an amazing discovery for me um, uh, through United Religions Initiative, the organization to which I serve at this moment is, yes, what is that bonds us together? We have different ways of practicing our beliefs. We have different beliefs. Uh, we may have different perspectives about different things. And yet, there's a lot that we can do together. And this is something that I learned through URI, um, the theory of change behind URI. The idea behind URI is that if people of different faiths, spiritual expressions and indigenous traditions do something for, for the common good, for the good of the community, we will avoid religiously motivated violence and finally create cultures of peace, justice, and healing. So for us at URI, the first line of our purpose statement is so important, daily enduring interfaith cooperation. And yes, dialogue is dialogue and is conversation, yet cooperation is a different dialogue, the dialogue of action. And to help the vulnerable, to uh, defend human rights, to clean a river, or to serve the children, you don't need to be of one or the other religion. You can collaborate, you can cooperate. And this is really behind the rationale of URI. And URI has a as a first principle has, we are not a religion, we are building bridges. And again, the bridge image comes again here. And I see the journalists have a similar symbol of of a bridge because the grounding and the going out. Um, what is needed, and I will pass to Kase so that we, uh, it's not only me talking at the one, one time, is um, what I have learned through URI um, is that deep listening or active listening is very important. Um, you have to, it is important that we have a genuine desire to learn from the other person when we are together with that person. And at the same time, this should be accompanied by genuine curiosity. It's not that I just bear or tolerate the two are different. It's the convincement that if I am open and I am curious enough, I'm going to get something that from you that enriches my life. And I'm sure that with what I bring to you, you are probably going to gain something that is good for your life. Um, in URI, and I always say that URI has been gifted of the right people at the right time 
uh, because when URI was in formation, um, there was this um, appreciative inquiry as a methodology starting to be developed at the Cleveland, Ohio University. There was this um, Dr. David Copperider, and he was showing us that if we, if we enter in a conversation with an appreciative mood that takes you to this deep listening um, with open curiosity, um, you, you ground your conversation in a way that lasts forever and creates collaboration. And in my beginnings of URI, working with appreciative inquiry has been so enlightening, so helpful as a methodology. So I pass on to Kase so that we exchange one back and forth. But one of the things that I suggest might be a good idea is for you to learn and explore this appreciative inquiry methodology that again is deep listening, curiosity, not trying to respond when a person is saying, well, I, uh, you want to convince the other, it's just listening and trying to understand what the other person is saying, the, the, what the person is bringing, what the person is teaching us. Cassie, what is your experience of interfaith? Thank you so much, Maria. As you say, it's just wonderful to hear and see, see your exuberance. It's very inspiring. Um, so if I give you a little background about myself in, in where I've come from, um, I come from a Jewish background, but went to a Christian faith school um, and have now uh, deeply engaged and involved myself in yoga. So um, <laughs> it's quite a, a myriad of different things things that have come together in my life. Um, I think what's very important is just understanding uh, what yoga really is, which is um, actually has very little to do with religion and much more to do with that inquiry that you were talking about. It's a certain self-inquiry um, using certain tools that have been offered uh, over thousands of years and passed through gener from generation to generation generation um, in a very specific way and uh, I've taken up some of those tools they're tools that allow um, not only spiritual inquiry but also allow for personal well-being on all levels so from body mind and spirit you are engaging in a way that is going to bring you to that place of full awareness that you've been speaking of where you're able to just be completely in this moment and engage and find what I found very beautiful about what you said was the the essence of what makes us all similar or the same as opposed to looking for what makes us so different it's wonderful and very important for humanity to have a diverse culture it, can you imagine if everybody was identical uh, what fun would being alive be <laughs> so it's wonderful that we all have all these wonderful different cultures as you say each one bringing a certain wisdom and a certain clarity from from, from I'm sure many, many generations and uh, losing that would be uh, not only tragic, which would make the world a much less exciting place to live. So in terms of where yoga is um, placed in all of that, uh, at the ashram that, uh, at the uh, Isha Yoga Center that uh, Dr. Raj has, has said exists in Coimbatore, there's also one in the USA called the Triple I Institute. Um, they have a temple there that is a non-denominational temple that is purely devoted to so just outside the temple there are there is um a statue for want of a better way of putting it that has every faith symbol on it all the major faiths at least um to invite everybody to do exactly what you're saying in the inter-religious discussions is basically saying what makes us the same and uh, at the source of that what yoga means is union union with what it's with everything so uh that is what you're basically seeking is to find that collective uni unity that collective consciousness which is no longer an idea um science has definitely moved us forward to a place where we know without any question that uh everything that there is in 
in this physical world is actually one thing. It's a universe, one song, one vibration, um, just showing up in many different ways. So if we can come from that perspective when we interrelate, which is why, you know, when we greet, we say namaskar, it means that I see in you what I have in me, as opposed to just uh, greeting hello. <laughs> it uh, acknowledges the, the unity within each other. So I think that's um, a very beautiful perspective that you brought to the table in terms of us looking at, uh, at what makes us more uh, united rather than what makes us different while celebrating the differences. I think it's so beautiful, especially coming from Africa um, and also seeing the cross-cultural religions actually having many similarities. Uh, that I found very interesting. So uh, seeing things like um, in yoga, you'll do the arm uh, and then seeing the arm main in so many different different cultures and religions, you can see how it actually all connects. Um, and that has been very, very beautiful seeing that. And here in Africa, seeing how they have um, essentially, like with the Native Americans, um, celebrated the earth a lot more than what our westernized cultures perhaps have been doing. Um, there is a lot more interest in the fact that nature is a part of uh, of creation and it is from the creator and therefore it's your connection to the creator and that we're a part of that and um, we're not above it we are part of it and so there's something very beautiful in those in those spaces that I I gain a lot of um, wisdom from and I think we need to return to in many different ways particularly those cultures that celebrated the earth because it's what we need the most right now um, I think across the world obviously as we know we were saying earlier that there's been climate change, weather is changing everywhere, um, with a little bit more celebration of that, of the elements of the space that we all hold sacred, um, because it's a part of who we are, not a part of it is what we are. Um, I think uh, that comes into this discussion. I think it it is something that we need to hold very dear in those cultures, and and perhaps those cultures can teach us a lot more than what we thought when. Uh, we try to be dogmatic with our own. Casey, and one of the things that we have fun with you or I is that you or I, because of that, um, the starting letters of the United Religions Initiative, we say you or I, and we always play that you or I. So if you or I, I take care of you, either another person or nature, in a way that I respect what is in you and, and coming from South Africa, I, I would say I've been in Rwanda this last week, uh, last year, and the Ubuntu, right? The idea of, of, of understanding that the others are should be treated in respectful and nice way as if it was for Ubuntu, us. Yes, Ubuntu uh, directly translated is um, I am because you are. So it's literally exactly what you've just said. Um, and it's such a beautiful and for part was, of our South African culture, and it's what's been taught to us from people who have lived here for for way longer than any Westerners that have that arrived. And, um, and it, it is, is effective function as a collective, as opposed to as a, a a single entity. And it is so interesting to have lived that or experienced that in places where there has been trauma, or um, war, or distance, or. World, so we need to recognize that the healing part of the work that dialogue may do has to do with trauma. There is a healing piece in the dialogue we need to understand. One, one of the, with Nancy, when she was in Argentina and her sister Gabby, we used to go to schools and try to bring children to this idea of diversity. And once, once uh, we went to a Catholic school and they had this big sign, which I always remember and bring when I have a conversation because um, they had put this, God created us distinct and we have become distanced. And with this kind of play of words and in Spanish is distante, distinto, it's kind of very similar is, um, I agree with what you say, 
we are one human being um, and we are all the same. And we have, um, as you also say, Casey, if everyone were exactly the same, this would be kind of a those terrible films of the future that show that every nothing is outstanding in one person or the other, but in the recognition that there is something distinct or different in each of us, this is the beauty and the richness of a garden that has many flowers, or even in a family, I have five kids, uh, all of them were brought in the same way and they are very different. And I cannot buy something for my eldest that is that fits my youngest. I have to be very attentive of the difference and the needs and their tastes and their um, wishes. So in the same way, we are different. The, the problem is that we are not coping with differences, that we are using differences to cut the dialogue, to divide our societies. And coming from Latin America, again, the politics sometimes kind of crush, divide us. And um, there are, so there's no respect for the different perspectives or the different ideas. And different ideas or different perspectives bring richness to a healthy dialogue. Um, but if we don't have, and then we might pass to this, what are the the needs for a healthy dialogue? What is a healthy dialogue? Um, is something that we need to study together. But um, yes, we are human and all the same in that sense, and we are different and unique um, on the other side of this understanding. And that doesn't uh, cut the dialogue. What cuts the dialogue if we are not ready to respect the the diversity? And um, so this, this is, is the work that we need uh, to wake this is the work... Sorry, this is the the work that uh, Satguru has taken on. This is what he's doing, and this is why I decided to volunteer my and actually devote my life to this work, which is the upliftment of human consciousness. Because if we do not uplift our consciousness, we cannot hear what you're saying. You know. Um, and saying my friend used to tell me my German friend used to say you can't feed a vomiting person so a person who just cannot hear it it doesn't help so the devotion that Sadhguru has put in to giving us the tools to actually look within and to uplift our own human consciousness has been life-changing for me transformative for me as opposed to even life-changing completely transformative as I have seen for thousands of people around me um, and millions across the world uh, by upliftment of human consciousness, we can hear all of that. And we're able to actually, um, for want of a better way of putting it, uh, like we have said before, identify more with what unites us than what distances us, even though we celebrate that distance. Because like you said, I love the idea of flowers in a garden. You're absolutely 100% correct about it. You don't ever judge another flower and say that one's not as good as this one. We just go, that one's purple, that one's yellow. It's it's so beautiful and it, it creates the most colorful space. Um, but if you do not have the consciousness and you do not yet have the awareness to be able to hear that or see that, it makes it incredibly difficult. And one of the most important aspects of that, obviously, is schooling and is youth. Um, so I, right now, I've also... Um, I have focused very, very deeply on writing for children because I do feel like um, we get so inundated with so many ideas, particularly kids today with all these screens, with all of these, uh, you know, the information is so vast uh, that it's, it's desperately important that our children can also just learn to explore of their own, of their own volition this wondrous aspect of what it is, what it means to be alive, what it means to be a part of life and not just a part of a culture or religion that is something added to their space as opposed to that strict identity with that space. So more about, you know, what is this one first? I think once you can identify that this one is actually some sort of cosmic being, it's made of the same stuff that is all around us. It's the same air that we all breathe. It's the same earth we eat from, all of that. That then creates a space where children are able to listen to each other, I think, a bit more. 
and we don't have the dogma that perhaps some of the older generation is kind of stuck with. Uh, so very much um, the concentration on youth is one of the, the major places that I think uh, the world needs to to be looking at to make sure that we that we garner and we we nurture a space for everybody to have this upliftment of consciousness and this upliftment of unification so that we can really have these discussions and still hang on to these wonderful traditions and these wisdoms because they also do provide a wonderful balustrade for life it does give you a sense of wonderful belonging part of this human curriculum for want of a better way of putting it you know, it's nice to say, you know, if you don't have somebody who has some sense of pride, um, and pr when I say sense of pride, I just mean to look after something. You know, if you have pride in your garden, you look after the garden. It's the same with your country. It's the same with your family, you know, and the wider and wider it goes, it'll be for the world. So I think it's very, very important that um, that children do have a sense of belonging and pride, but at the same time that they have first identified themselves with the very fundament of who they are which is just a piece of life on this earth no better no worse than any other piece of life on this earth thank you casey thank you maria i i listen carefully what what you say and i i guess we have i have to say that we have people from all over the world <laughs> that yes. are joining us yes. in the zoom yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, people from say, Bosnia, exactly. yeah, people from Argentina, Cambodia, South Africa, Italy, Guatemala, USA, Samoa, Nancy. Yeah, Nancy. Tanzania, Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria, uh, Greece, Bangladesh, Canada, Egypt. So it's a little bit war here. <laughs> We are so, at the moment on a global platform, so it's exactly. so interesting. And the most important thing is, like our speakers mentioned, you know, we are all part of humanity. Different religions, uh, I mean, take for example, Cassie Dolan, right? She was born a Jewish, in a Jewish family. She, in a, in a formative years, she probably practiced Judaism. And then she went to a Christian school and, and, and were exposed to Christianity there. And in her later life, she is now very much involved in a program that is very much Hindu based. So uh, very, very apt. Uh, and, and she has been able to tell us how the different regions have basically the same principles and ideologies and so on that made her realize that, you know, uh, this calling is so important. So, yes, a very, very good discussion from both Maria as well as Cassie. What do you think, Nancy? Yes, I think the same. We, we have now a question from the audience. So I want to, to read the question. It's from Argentina, from Leti, uh, that I thank you for this space. I want to ask, how do the speakers recommend to start the dialogue about interfaith in a company where we have more than 20 different cultures. So I guess the question is how to start this, because I guess the, the Maria and Casey have found in, in your life uh, a path of dialogue, a path of openness, but how can we start this? No, I think uh, this is a very good question. One of uh, my amazing, stories and it's interesting because here's diversity too so uh, this is Casey's story as you said Robert uh, Rachendran and my experience is being a Catholic since a child being brought up by a Catholic family having chosen to be a Catholic in my own family life and at the same time this gives me a lot of curiosity and um hunger for learning without losing my identity, which I feel is is so basic to me. But I think that one of, sometimes we may confuse identity with individualism. It's not that I believe that this is the only way I believe or I should believe. I think this is my path. This is the way that I um, have my spiritual bond. And at the same time, I'm very respectful of the others. So to respond to Letty's question, one of the things that I feel that is important 
is a little bit what I said I have learned about URI is um, this appreciative inquiry, but also that comes from something that is very core for our organization that is appreciation. Um, and in, in the global world, as we were saying at the beginning, something we may be lacking is um, deep appreciation of oneself and deep appreciation of the others. Um, and so in that context that Letty, you, you say, you have 20 different ways of practicing in your company, how to start the dialogue is, I, and I would come with words that um, our Pope Francis told me here in Argentina when he was the Cardinal, um, we have to tiptoe interfaith dialogue. So we have to be very careful uh, because going into interfaith, you are going into something that is very deep in the, the spiritual life of each person is so deep and so important. And so how do we do that in a very careful way? So if you have to start an interfaith dialogue in your company or among your friends, one of the things that I would suggest is do a little bit of, um, one of the things I feel is so important to be careful with your words. Um, one of the things and the tips that we gave with, to teachers in here in the Bridge Builders program is uh, your, your words can build and destroy. We don't always understand the power of words. And children at school is may, may bully someone else and said, well, I only said this and that. And it is only, it's not only, it's with your words, you can be harmful. And this can provoke trauma and division and again, violence. So um, as a first point, I would say, let us take care of the words that we use when we are with others, how they are respectful of others. Um, one other thing is try not to give something as, yeah, assumptions are very bad. So you assume that this tradition or that tradition feel this way. Um, again, there's uniqueness in each of the person. You don't assume, you don't judge, you just come with curiosity. It is not good to generalize when you just say, well, all Jewish, all Christians, all Hindus do this and that. That's not helpful because there's, within the same tradition, there is diversity and, if, and, and each of the persons is diverse. Um, Another thing is trying not to talk about saying, well, this person said that. When you are open in a dialogue, uh, it is important to speak for yourself, not for mm. others. And never undermine a person publicly or criticize a person's faith or character. Again, tiptoeing because we people have to be very careful with other people. We are sensitive and we are open to dialogue, but this dialogue is, is a bridge that we have to take care of. Those are my uh, advices, Leti. Okay, we have another uh, uh, participant who would like to ask something. So I think to make this dialogue more engaging, we're gonna invite people that have made comments here to unmute themselves and speak himself. For example, we have Dr. Jerome Tege uh, from Kampala in Uganda, right? Can you unmute yourself, Dr. Jerome, and express yourself? Hey. Unmute yourself. You're muted. I think, else, I think someone else was expressing themselves in the room. <laughs> so <laughs> I think. <laughs> so, Dr. Jerome, you still have the floor if you want to say something. If not. Okay, let me say something. I'm sorry that uh, my daughter here uh, was making some noise. I didn't get it. Oh, no problem. 
she's part of the yeah, discussion. I'm happy to be part of this conversation. Uh, I think uh, I was part of a dialogue of interfaith without even knowing for some years, because in Uganda, I am born, my mother was a staunch Catholic. My father was a son of a reverend, an Anglican reverend. And then when I grew up, I found myself working with the evangelicals. And then we have another brother of mine that follows me. He's a Muslim because I was raised by a Muslim uncle who raised me up. And then I have another brother of mine is a Jehovah's Witness. Mm -hmm. So when we sit at home, we cannot pretend that we are not different. So we, it is interesting to, to hear what everybody has and also try to live with everybody uh, because we are brothers. We have the same brothers, but we have different faith. Now in my home, my wife comes from another culture. I also come from another culture. And we, we try to use English at home. So either way, we have no option but to try to create a dialogue in terms of I may not agree, but at least I should understand that you're different from me. I'm different from you, but maybe your difference is not so much different from me because I'll give one more example. In Uganda, all meat is slaughtered by Muslims. And if you are going to have uh, a party at your home, even if you are a Protestant, you must invite a Muslim neighbor to slaughter the animal because you never know by chance a Muslim friend may come to eat the food. And because of that, you must respect that. But uh, partly, I'm a cultural anthropologist. So this part of my training, but beyond that, I have no option. We have no option in this world but to dialogue. Otherwise, you can spend all your time getting annoyed of the different people. But come on, we, we all eat and we all die. And God created us differently. Excellent, Dr. Jerome. Excellent input. A very, very inspirational and a very, very good example to have been, you know, for this particular platform. Nancy, I think you've got somebody. Yes, we have a question of Bruce uh, Leonard from the U.S., if, they, if he can unmute and do the question uh, now. Yeah, Bruce. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm curious about how we can create and motivate and have our leaders incorporate morals into their legislating. And, um, you know, one thought is that all religions believe in the golden rule in some form. Why not have our leaders pledge to follow the golden rule? Now, the reality is that within many political systems, and I'll, I'll speak uh, about the US political system, it would be impossible for our leaders to follow the golden rule because our system is so divided. Now, if we demanded each politician would only run for one term, then they could legislate instead of campaigning for their next term, where they will become beholden to corporations and to their party. So that's just a suggestion for our political system, um, and maybe it can apply for others. But I think we need moral leadership in our political systems. Yes, and I think, uh... Bruce, more so because a political leader, even if it's a president or prime minister of the country, 
He has his own religion. However, he is a leader of a country that is multi-religious and multicultural. So he has, a, or she, has a much more important role to play. Uh, Cassie, you'd like to answer this? Uh, I can definitely chime in here. Um, my feeling on, on morality is that uh, it is something that obviously has been very severely lacking within the definitely within the, the the government systems and that's because what we're trying to do as politicians is to sell something to gain power as opposed to truly be in service so again it will come to a place where you can push morality but i don't think morality is something that can be pushed it has it has to be intrinsic within a human being and unfortunately politics has been incredibly jaded with uh, corruption because there is greed and there is power. And um, I think there was a saying, somebody said power corrupts. Um, and that seems to be incredibly true from our history. So I think uh, essentially, I mean, it's an interesting idea that you, you've you suggested having uh, a shorter term, but I would suggest perhaps the opposite. <laughs> I would say, uh, due to the fact that people have a four-year term in the, at least in the American society and in South, definitely in our country in South Africa, um, it's four years, and then again you're campaigning. Our policies don't ever go through in the way that the people had originally um, voted them in for. So they can campaign, and then they can just cop out of that because they've got the next campaign. And it does take an inordinate amount of time because within two years you can't really shift. Um, what essentially can be a titanic situation heading for an iceberg like climate change. So if you look at something like um, what Satguru has put forward, like Save Soil, which is a movement, you know, to encourage organic content to be placed back in the soil in order to alleviate climate change, essentially it'll do an enormous amount for that and provide us with better food and, um, and continue to keep life alive because there's desertification across the world. But I'm digressing. The point about that is that if you change the policies that are in government at the moment, in four years' time, we can't be sure that they'll be carried through. So they have to be carried through for the next 25, 30 years in order for these things to, to be done. I'm not necessarily saying that we want one person in government for 25 years. But what I am saying is that perhaps an eight-year term without having to be um, changed and uh, manipulated so that the greed and the power starts to turn into more of a service oriented creation of the policies that we're all voting for. I think as individuals, we have an incredible opportunity when it comes to democracy to use our voices. But unfortunately, we're not all schooled in that direction. We tend to vote, um, especially in America, um, if I, I may say, uh, because there are only two major parties. You are voting um, for a party as opposed to for a policy. And so what happens if you have this wonderful, diverse um, uh, challenge of a government governance, you start voting for the policies and for what it is that those people, perhaps if you want to put it in, in those terms morally, uh, if that is what you, you would prefer to, to follow, then perhaps that's who you would be able to vote in. But at the moment in the United States in particular, you have two parties and that's all you have. It's bipartisan and you're stuck. Because if you don't agree with the policies necessarily that are going forward from the one party, but you are, you see yourself as Republican or you see yourself as a Democrat, you're in trouble. You only have two places to go. So I would say um, diversity would be a much more interesting space for the American politics space to, to go in order for that to be something that you as a citizen can start really investigating and using your own um your own moral compass and your own ideas on what you think is best and really vote in the people that you believe their policies will be followed through. I think that's a much more interesting space, but I'm not sure. I think that's, <laughs> that's a long way away. I don't think that we're necessarily there as a, as a human racial human consciousness at this point, but I think it's a wonderful idea that would go forward. Um, and especially for our youth to be looking at um, as something that we are not so, 
uh, bipartisan and we are much more inclusive and looking at much more uh, diverse opinions and much more diverse. Uh, even when we talk in the moral space, we can definitely be start becoming um, stuck in two different realms. And I, I do think it's very important that we rather talk about um, the unification and about the policies that those people are in service for. I think as a as a humanity, when you're talking about politics, which is not really this discussion, but when you are talking politics, I think politics is a space of service, not a space of greed and power. And unfortunately, it has become a space of greed and power. But the more diverse that politics becomes, the less greed and power is allowed because there's a lot more people that can come forward with their diverse opinions. And you as a public can vote those people in. Thank you so much. Thank Nancy? You so much. Yes, we have um, a hand up from Dennis Eckwer, so we can give him the floor to unmute. Thank you, Dennis. Yes. Okay, thank you very much for this interesting conversation. Um, my name is Dennis Eckwer. I work with uh, children and young people living for peace, Nigeria. Um, so interesting that um, this has come up this time, especially in a country uh, that's so diverse in terms of uh, religious difference. Um, I think, and I suggest that um, we really need to do a lot, especially the kind of story that we carry, you know, uh, because um, stories that um, carries a lot of war, you know, conflicts and all around, you know, sometimes impacts so much on children when they watch, when they're listening. And we negate um, talking, giving story, building uh, storytelling news on peaceful coexistence of citizens, communities living together. Uh, there's not so much um, investigative journalism, per se, from my country, where people you know, investigate how communities live together so that it can be like an example. People can learn from how people coexist together. You know, rather than all the time giving us um, about, uh, conflicts and all that. So I suggest strongly that we need to look into that so that children can begin to learn how people live together, how people use dialogue to resolve conflicts, how people use dialogue, you know, to solve issues before they escalate. And so that's just my point and that's just my take. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, colleagues, I just want to state we have two questions and we're going to take that as the last two questions because we still have to play the videos for the second part and we have to complete by uh, in, a, in 30 minutes time. So I would like to ask Mohammed Musa Kaba to unmute himself and make his input. Thank you. Mohammed. Um, Hello, can you hear me, please? Go ahead. Um, thank you for the opportunity given to me. Um, I'm so grateful to be here, participating. And I'm raising a concern because um, I'm really disappointed at the number of people that attend the program um, of the meeting. Yes, yeah, because the age limit um, is way too um, higher, or I'm, ex I'm not expecting that kind of range. I'm expecting uh, you people to um, more collaborate and play an active role in this kind of uh, dialogue or gathering, because uh, I believe this will shape um, the lifestyle of the youth today. Because I've been seeing a lot of youth going astray, um, living a life that um, they don't supposed to live, um, neglecting education. Uh, but I believe if they get themselves uh, in this kind of platform, they will be able to learn a lot from experienced people like you, all of you in this gathering. Um, so I just want to raise um, a question. How are we going to foster this one? Or how are we going to implement this for a dialogue for the youth to participate in such discussion? Thank you. I think uh, due to the uh, clarity of the, the sound, basically, Mohammed is asking how the youth can participate in interfaith dialogues, what program can be put into place. And I think similarly to what was mentioned earlier on for the workplace situation, similar programs can be hosted at schools, for example, at universities, where this platform be created for people to come around in a social gathering and they can talk about 
different aspects pertaining to the religion, culture, etc. So they can learn from each other. If this is done regularly, it can become a very, very interesting platform. So maybe that could be an option and maybe other options that, you know, uh, that can be very innovative. Nancy, and I think you, uh, Maria. Yeah, and I'm I'm hearing uh, both in what is in the chat and also what Mohammed was saying is that how to engage youth, and I think that in many ways youth are um, are fed up of some of the things that we adults are get very uh, usually. It, that is this competition. How do we bring them to from competition to collaboration. I think that there is a possibility to sit in a circle. Indigenous people have taught us a lot in URI what it is to be a, in circle, in circle with where what Casey was pointing out about um, reality in, in corruption or power is the power issues. Um, we are accustomed to systems that are some over the other, and uh, we don't sit in a place where we share, where we collaborate. And so I think that there is a space for youth to bring that wisdom of um, being, yeah, being outside the power issue and um, discussing with openness and uh, and also what I feel regarding youth is the need of action. So that's why collaboration is so important, is there are so many issues that we need to address. Quarreling because of power is doesn't make sense. We have to sit together in a circle and try to solve the problems of the world. You were naming nature, the environmental crisis is nothing to say, leave it for tomorrow. Um, we are all living into the disaster ecological disaster, youth are more conscious of that. Um, I would say inviting youth to work together and collaborate for the issues that are pressing at the moment is one way of engaging youth in interfaith. Probably it's not kind of a theological discussion, it's more as what should we do together um, and uh, for the betterment of the world. When, when I was listening, I heard that um, that the gentleman was saying that he was disappointed with, you know, the way that the the fragment of his of his peers had kind of gone astray. I just wanted to say that there is something on YouTube. It's called Youth and Truth um, that Sadhguru held. He went around to universities and to schools around India, in particular, I think, and then I think a few places in the United States. Um, allowing youth to ask their questions around many, many, many diverse different topics um, that they were facing regarding especially the breakdown of certain um, morality, to bring that word up again, uh, and, and very much uh, a space of how do they bring much more awareness to all of the issues that are, they're currently facing, like climate change and like... Um, marriage that be, has become you know unsanctified for the most part in many many different spaces in the west in particular um so i think uh, if you want to take a look at youth and truth there's many many videos that are online on youtube and that would be very very interesting to engage with i think for thank you casey yes thank you casey thank you maria we have the I think the last question from Josephine. So that regards to to peace, how can we build peace in a in a world with lots of wars? So if Josephine is uh, can unmute, we can hear her. Uh, she's, yeah, Josephine. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful gathering. Uh, my question is um, on how to build peace in a society that is torn by war using interfaith uh, or interreligious dialogue. 
is it possible why why uh, when people there is already polarization people each one is uh, on his own position how can we bring people together to talk about peace in such a situation thank you thank you so much um, I, i think we uh, maybe maria could quickly answer because we really press for time now very short thank you for one. this question uh, joseph and i think that the just the challenge of the time there are many wars that that are affecting the interfaith dialogue in uri we have a thousand hundred cooperation circles and groups around the world and uh, it is difficult to moderate the listservs or the whatsapp groups because uh, it is so easy to take sides from one side or the other i am in four this and against that and necessarily uh, get into the vision. What I have been trying to do as moderator of our URI listserv is to find the third side, the side, the side of the undivided, the side of those that understand that there is pain in one side and the other side. Um, and we have to avoid this to continue. But at the same time, I, I'll tell you, it's challenging. And also there's so much trauma and there's so much history that this is not easy. So uh, we have to do our best to find a place for the undivided. But it is, yeah, the world is usually asking us to be take sides or be fragmented or polarized. I think there is, there is one basic tenet that that every human being going forward in life should always take forward that when children are dying when children are being left without parents that it cannot happen it literally just cannot happen i think if we come from that tenet where there is just no place in humanity where that is allowed where that is something that can happen i think it's a wonderful starting point for discussion From there forward, I think every human being who has even the slightest glimmer of compassion can understand that no child should be involved in a war. And the minute that you understand that, it can no longer happen going forward. Discussion has to be the way forward. Hi, thank, thank you. you so thank you so much. And I think um, without much further ado, Let us begin our journey into the vibrant tapestry of global interfaith storytelling, guided by the voices and experiences of our esteemed participants. We're going to play the videos one after the other without any break. Mehmet, thank you. I think there is no sound. I don't know if it's me. Yeah, the sound. Uh, sorry about it. You know, I am sorry about it. So I'll share the sound and uh, one more time. Sorry for this. Thank you. This age of globalization needs to wise people in each faith who can examine their sacred writings and traditions in order to identify aspects that can benefit all humanity as well as those that preserve each religion's naming. United Nations designated first week of Feb as Interfaith Harmony Week every year. I call on people to honor 
divine theology in a way that encourages respect understanding for the benefit of all communities and peace in the world let's celebrate interfaith dialogue so this was our uh, youth from uh, Muntazur Mehdi from India. Now let's go to our next youth representative and his name is uh, Tahir Malulana from Albania. Now, sorry to make you late. Oh, no problem bro, you know worship is always first so let's go. What do you want for a drink? Uh, I think I like this because I never drink. You cannot drink this. It contains alcohol. Oh, really? Uh, that's nice. It's a, uh, I think uh, you go uh, pray first, and I will order you a drink, so it can it will be halal and uh, recommended one. I hope you don't mind waiting for me here. As you said, worship is the first. Hello. Your thanks. Your thanks. Thank you. Oh, Your thanks. Oh, 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 to be honest, this is my first time praying. Really? Well, I know the rules and everything, but I've never tried it. It's fine. So let's try to do it now. Yeah. Oh my God, ready? thank you. Are you this okay? Well, let's I go. Know. I can learn fast thing with you guys and more about Islam. Okay, guys, now it's time for our discussion. Oh, that's great. Let's put the idea right now. Oh, let me guess. That must be the new prize. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> must be. The youth are very creative in, in this video. Now we have Ashley Kitisha from Kenya. My name is Ashley Kitisha with Laudato Si Movement, sharing the story of interfaith dialogue and its ability to bring together various stakeholders to endorse the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. Throughout the years, because of the coming together of networks in Nairobi, we have been able to empower and equip young high school students to understand the importance of fossil fuel non-proliferation. Last year, we had the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Forum with youth and also inviting various stakeholders in which young people were able to present the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty proposal and it was received by the nuncio and the first lady of the local government of the region in which we were meeting and that is Kajiado. We really thank the Interfaith Network for always facilitating dialogue and strategies for peace building and also for supporting initiatives that tackle the climate crisis while also promoting peace and security. Thank you so much. Excellent message. Uh, and yeah. Our next use uh, is from the US, Bera Tretgen. Hi everyone, my name is Bera Tretgen. I'm a recent college graduate who lives in Brooklyn, New York, United States. Today I will talk about my interfaith experience in the United States. And since high school and during my college years, I've been having so many uh, opportunities in the interfaith. But I would like to talk about the biggest experience that I have. And for me, the most uh, outstanding one, which is a program called Young Peace Builders. Uh, Young Peace Builders is a program um, that been happening for more than 10 years, even before I was in the United States. And I started attending to Young Peace Builders in my high school years. 
and for two years I was part of it and after then the college I was a mentor it let me talk about the program the program is uh, designed to bring people bring Muslim Turkish high school kids with Jewish high school kids who live in the same community and same neighborhood and connect them to share their religion their uh, cultures their ideas and just make them friends and um, this in this program we we had visited as a high school student uh, together with our Jewish friends um, synagogues mosques we did Shabbat dinners together we did iftar dinners together we visited Washington DC and Holocaust Museum so all these are great experience for high school students uh, both from both sides to have uh, in the name of the interfaith and I was proud to say that I was an attendee and after that I was a mentor during the college years and we are hoping to continue this program and expand it to the uh, Christians as well. Thank you so much. This is one example of my interfaith experience here in the United States. Have a good one. Well, what a nice experience from the USA. Now let's go to Indonesia, uh, we have Fikri Abdullah. Hello, I'm Fikri Abdullah, and today I want to talk about my uh, stories about my interfaith dialogue when I was in vocational high school. Well, I come from Indonesia, actually. Precisely, I come from uh, Java Island. So, in a small corner of Java Island, or we call it as Tanah Java, filled with diversity. I encountered classmates representing different uh, religions. Initially, we clung to stereotypes and prejudices, of course. However, when a class project uh, forced us to collaborate, we began to experience a shift. Our first meeting, of course, it was filled with misunderstanding and um, awkwardness. Yet, through open dialogue and active listening, we started to see the universal values we all shared Light-hearted humor also helped ease tension, paving the way for camaraderie. Well, when societal issues arose, we, des uh, we decided to work together regardless of religious backgrounds. Slowly but surely, we realized that the power of unity transcended our beliefs. Over time, our small Tanajaba evolved into a place where tolerance and understanding were the foundation. The climax came when we celebrated a diversity festival. It's called Dieng Festival in my hometown. And at the moment, my classmates and I recognized that through dialogue and tolerance, we could create enduring uh, harmony. Our unity not only fostered peace among us, but also inspired the surrounding community. With our unity, we proved that religious diversity is not a hindrance, but a richness. This is a second piece I told each one of you. The girl, the she works in the respect and relations, was said to build yeah. peaceful and harmony. How is your relationship with all the sports in the Pavilion now? Because she talks about, she no no have a very good relationship. Dr. Governor, would you mind muting yourself? Sorry. All right, so this is uh, Fikri Abdullahi. Yeah. And he talked about how he got together with youth um, to, to work on climate change and other issues. And now we're going to uh, Kenya. We have uh, Harun Tuku, and he's going to talk about his interfaith experience. There is beauty in diversity. Our differences are not divides, but threads to weave a tapestry of understanding. Good morning. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Harun Thuku from Kenya, and we are honored to celebrate the World Interfaith Harmony Week here at Harmony Institute. It is truly inspiring to be part of an organization that values the peaceful coexistence of the human fraternity. Harmony Institute has been at the forefront of connecting communities and empowering individuals to, support, to contribute in dialogue, peace, and community building. I am surrounded by a tapestry of religions and cultures, and I have friends from various religious backgrounds. Of course, it has not been an easy journey. There were moments of misconception and misunderstanding, 
but it, but it is during these challenges that I learned to appreciate the importance of patience, empathy, and open communication. As I reflect on my interfaith journey today, I am grateful for the friendship formed, wisdom gained, and unity discovered. Interfaith dialogue is crucial for breaking down barriers and building bridges. I encourage everyone to explore interfaith dialogue, to step out of our comfort zones, and to engage with others in open, uh, with an open mind and heart. Let us embrace the diversity around us, engage in conversations, listen to each other, and celebrate the unique qualities that make us who we are. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Harun. I think this is an excellent uh, you know, message uh, where youth are building bridges. And Okay, let's now go to our next uh, youth representative, uh, Youth Voices uh, from the USA. And this is Kenan Bayraktarovic from USA and Montenegro. Hello. So my name is Kenan Bayraktarovic. Um, and I'm a currently a first year in college. I go to Emory University. And my mom, so she was born in the city of Warsaw as a Catholic. Well, my dad was born in Plav, Montenegro, a small village. Um, as a Muslim, and um, my mom would eventually convert to Islam when she moved to the United States. However, I still do have the opportunity to observe the values of Christianity through like my grandparents and my relatives on my Polish side. And it really does make for a really interesting dynamic because um, whenever I'll go to visit like my Polish grandparents, let's say, um, I'll, I'll go for Christmas and still um, celebrate with them. However, I still do um, have the opportunity to fast for Ramadan and celebrate Bayram, you know. And I feel like having these two different perspectives, it really influences how I am as a person today. And I really can see and understand many perspectives in many aspects of life, not just regarding religion, you know. And I also suggest that we all take a step even greater than just understanding other religions, you know. Um, when we're exposed to them. So if you see a friend fasting, whether it's for Yom Kippur or Ramadan, maybe try to fast alongside them just so that they don't feel alone. Or maybe try to read a few pages of a Bible, of a friend's Bible, and see in the lens of them, you know. Watch videos to understand the true meaning behind um, and history behind like Confucianism or Hinduism. And because after all, there are still many lessons to be learned from all of us, no matter what God we believe in. So yeah, thank you for listening. A wonderful experience. Thank you to Kenan. And now uh, we will be going to another youth representative, uh, Youth Voices from Kenya. Uh, this time we have Salim Abdullah. Hello world. I'm Salim Abdullah Ahmed from Kenya. Uh, working with Hamoun Institute for Interreligious and Interfaith Dialogue. I'm, in, I'm excited to be part of the Global Voices Youth Interfaith Digital Storytelling during the World Interfaith Harmony Week. In a world that often feels divided, I believe it is crucial for us, the global youth, to come together and share our stories. Our background, culture, and faith should be the bridge that connects us and not dividing us. Growing up, I was surrounded by different faith and tradition. My childhood friend came from various backgrounds, each bringing a unique flavor during our faith campaigns. Interfaith dialogue is not just a mere understanding about each other. Rather, it is a unique way on how we are supposed to engage and share our thoughts and during while serving our humanity. It's about realizing that our differences make us, us stronger and together we can share and build a world where respect and harmony and unity thrive. I invite you to be part of the Global Voices campaign. Share your interfaith stories, your experience and your vision for a harmonious world. Let's amplify our voices and create a narrative that inspire changes. As we celebrate World Interfaith Harmony Weeks, let's remember that our diversity is our strength. 
and our voices we unite when united can create a positive changes join me in this incredible journey of storytelling and dialogue together let's make the world a more harmonious understanding places use hashtag use the hashtag and having a conversation why global voice campaign thank you thank you salim for joining our global voices youth interface uh, digital storytelling campaign and now we have suleiman uh, from nigeria good day everyone my name is aruna suleiman from nigeria i want to share with you my experience regard to interfaith dialogue in the year 2020, I had the enlightening opportunity to participate in an interfere dialogue program in Abuja. That gathering brought together a diverse array of individuals, including imams, reverends, and pastors, to engage in a meaningful discussion. But prior to that experience, the concept of interfere dialogue was somewhat nebulous to me. I couldn't grasp the significance of bringing together different individuals under the same roof to discuss on something. However, as the dialogue unfolded, I found myself captivated by the depth of understanding and respect that permeated the room. It was through that conversation that I gained newfound clarity regarding the goals and invaluable benefit of interfaith dialogue. Witnessing first-hand exchange of perspectives and sharing of beliefs, mutual respect that underscored every interaction, I was profoundly moved. That transformative experience not only broadened my own perspective, but also challenged preconceived notions I held about different religious ideologies. It became abundantly clear to me that interfaith dialogue served as a powerful catalyst for fostering understanding and empathy. As I reflect on this experience, I am filled with the sense of optimism and hope for the future. I firmly believe that interfaith dialogue hold the key to mitigating religious tension and cultivating a world where mutual respect and peaceful coexistence prevail. Thank you very much. Um, our special thanks to Suleiman for sharing his uh, thoughts with us. And uh, definitely interfaith dialogue transforms us to become better persons and better understand our neighbors, friends. Now we have our Next youth representative, uh, Nimit Aysan from the US. Hello everyone, I'm Nimit Aysan and I'm extremely grateful to be sharing a piece of my journey with you all today. As a young adult, I'm deeply passionate about equal human rights, sustainable development, and equal opportunity for those who aren't as fortunate as we are. As early as middle school, I've been pouring my heart into making a positive impact on my community and communities worldwide through various avenues such as service, passion projects, internships, and clubs. But today, I want to talk about something that has shaped me profoundly, my interfaith journey. Growing up, my parents instilled in me the importance of understanding and respecting different faiths. We have a tradition of hosting interfaith dinners through gatherings such as Abrahamic tables, knowing each other, and annual interfaith dinners in churches, synagogues, and most importantly, our home. These experiences weren't just dinners, they were opportunities that opened doors to countless invaluable experiences such as networking and connecting, which has led me to collaborate with influential figures such as the mayor here in Pittsburgh and scholars like Dr. Craig Considine. I can't put into words the profound impact that these one-of-a-kind experiences have had on my worldview and has granted me the chance to unlock new perspectives on a spectrum of issues challenging my preconceived notions and offering nuanced understandings on pr pressing matters, further enhancing my awareness and perception of conversing viewpoints. I found myself discussing controversial topics now with empathy and ease, as well as understanding the complexity of global affairs. As we celebrate World Interfaith Harmony Week in 2024, let us remember to foster unity, understanding, and respect through our stories. Together, let's build a more interconnected and compassionate world, all in the spirit of harmony. Thank you for listening to a part of my story. Let's make a difference together. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nimit. And our last video is from the Kurdistan, Iraq, uh, from Abdul Ghaffar uh, Horshid. <laughs> Thank you. 
ایرا هرمی کردوسانی عراقه با نزیکهی لسده پانزا بو لسده حوی کماری عراق پیک ده هنه لم هرمه دا این زاکانی مسلمان و مسیحی و جو کاکی و زردشتی ایزیدی و صابی ایمان دائی پیک و دجین گرچی زورینه هرمی کردوسان مسلمانن بلام ده خورالاتی هم هرمه و تا خور اوائل باکوره و بباشوری لرابردوی و تا اسای شارکی تیدانیا که باوردار و آین و مسابی جا جای لخودا کونه کرده بیتاو تنانت پیکا و جیانی آینی لم هریم دا با تناسنامو و همای جا کروی هریمی کردوستان لخور حالاتی ناو راز دا کردوستان مزخانه که دسر روی زمین با همو آینکانی پیشو شنواری نشت جیبونی نو کوسو و شقامی هر شارکی هریمی کردوستان پرا لادگاری و بیرواری و پیکا و جیانی آینزا جاوازا کن که همیشه لپیواندی کومالایتی بطین دا بود هاتو چه یک سرده کن اما دینه تعزیه ایمه ایمه ده چین یک سرده بینین چه شکمانی کس بکس بکس استفزاز ده که نکس یک چند لگل ناکو ناکو تره بابا این شتگ نیه بابا این خوان خواستا حقیز من برام بر یعنی بیان اوان برام بر ایمانی بی بفید سوان و برادریش منو بس داری خمو قوشه کن یک تریش ده که اینو پیکا و هنگ ده جورم پیکا و ده چین پرسه کن یعنو زور اتیاریشه لقرآن نداءها تعالوا إلى كلمة سيئة. All right, I think you know this video was a little long, so we just showed you only the two minutes. But however, we are going to post all these videos on our YouTube channel and in our social media. So you are most than welcome to watch uh, the rest of the movies, uh, stories uh, shared by the youth. Uh, it's over to you, Dr. Governor and Nancy. Uh, so Thank you. Thank you. Youth voices. Thank you. Nancy, ladies first. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Rajendra. No, it, for me, it was an, an, an honor to moderate the webinar. I have to thank uh, Maria, Casey to join for joining us and all the people that was uh, writing questions and speaking about uh, interfaith dialogue, how can we um, develop the skills to to practice this, to put in practice this interfaith dialogue. So for me, it's an honor. Uh, we see you, inshallah, soon. <laughs> so thank you, thank you so much. And, and my colleague also, Rajender, for being here. Uh, Mr. Mehmet, uh, Jembre. <laughs> so for me, it was it was an honor to moderate this webinar. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Nancy. And I would like to uh, express my deep sense of gratitude to the Journalists and Writers Foundation for hosting this, for providing such great administrative support in making this uh, dialogue a success. It was a great event. Um, great discussions, very inspiring. And I would believe that, uh, you know, all the participants that are there, they are going to go back home realizing how important it is for interfaith dialogue. Cassie, thank you so much. Maria, you've been phenomenal. Um, you know, uh, we would expect you to attend more of our programs, talking about more of our programs. Uh, the Journalists and Writers Foundation have a host of programs throughout the the year but one of the flagship programs is on the occasion of the united nation uh national general assembly in september right where they have a whole lot of panel discussions and it culminates in an awards program where uh, there will be an invitation to the global community that are doing remarkable work in terms of attaining the sustainable development goals so all of you here on this platform, please popularize this event. Please follow us on our uh, social media platforms uh, where uh, you know, organizations in different parts of the world are doing work in order to attain the sustainable development goals. There's uh, lucrative uh, cash prizes, uh, awards, and there's a whole lot of uh, recognition. So, so please take note of that and follow us on our social media platforms, and you'll be able to get more information about the Sustainable Development Goals 
awards program. Um, it will be advertised soon, and then you can just popularize this. Maybe some of you yourself are doing remarkable work, and we want to acknowledge you for your work um, in, in this program. So thank you so much, everybody. We managed to complete just three minutes above time, I think. But um, I think, Mr. Mehmet, uh, on behalf of JWC, maybe you have the closing remarks. Well, I would like to thank every one of you, uh, our speakers, Maria, Casey, and Dr. Governor Nancy. Uh, and uh, also, I would like to thank uh, all the participants for their contributions, uh, for sharing their reflections, asking questions to making this program more engaging and more uh, interactive. We truly appreciate that. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank the youth for sharing their stories, their interface stories with us. They are really amazing. And we would like to do more events uh, that will engage you in interface and intercultural dialogue. Once again, thank you, everyone, uh, and hope to see you in our next program. Uh, actually, before closing, uh, September, uh, I mean, March uh, is the month of women, uh, you know, uh, uh, Commission on Status of Women, uh, which starts from March 11th to 22nd. So we will have uh, 12 panel discussions. Uh, eight of them will be in person in New York and four of them will be online. So we will share all the information with us. So just keep, you know, uh, you know, uh, following us and we will uh, like to see you.